Well, welcome to our, you know, what should be our 99th annual dinner. I don't think it actually is. Uh, well, we had to skip a couple, but here we are back together again, and what a glittering group you are. You, you just look wonderful. It's, it's nice to be back again amongst people, um, even if we don't know entirely how to behave with one another. For example, you all keep talking. <laughs> Which I, I guess is acceptable when you're on Zoom and you can kind of mute the speaker. Um, I'm, I'm just going to kick things off. We're, what we're going to do, uh, the order of battle t tonight, is um, that we're going to begin with the Friendly Medal Award uh, to our Attorney General, America's Attorney General, um, and that'll be, that'll be very good. And then we will have dinner, and after dinner, um, John Bellinger and Diane orton Licker uh, will be talking about um, some of the legal issues involved in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and that will be um, also, I think, extremely interesting for all of us. Uh, Ricky and I have been, we, we had a great day today, by the way, and we've been saying uh, to anybody who will listen that we cannot thank Stephanie Middleton enough for her 12 years of service. So. So we will thank her again. And um, may I also say, um, Katanji, how proud we are of our council member. <laughs> it's it's quite the organization, really, when you when you think about it. Um, the. Attorney General uh, is here, I would say, in force. Uh, we invited his, some of his, well, all of his law clerks, and many of them are here. Welcome, Garland Law Clerks. Uh, <laughs> uh, among your law clerks is the Solicitor General of the United States, Elizabeth Preliger. <laughs> And we also invited as many of the friendly law clerks who were able to come tonight as well. I don't know where they are, but thank you for being here. <laughs> in addition to the hard work that we do, and it is, it is good work and, and hard work and important work, uh, one of the wonderful things about being involved in the American Law Institute is the people you meet. And I feel so lucky um, that I have come to know through this organization, Ray Loyer. Uh, Ray is just a, a remarkable person. I knew of him because my nephew had clerked for him, uh, but I didn't really know Ray, and, I, and now I have come to know him through the ALI. He, he went to, um, to Harvard College, well, we all do that, so that's not <laughs> that that's not that big a deal. But uh, when when Ray was at at Harvard College, he studied with John Rawls. I mean, that's pretty special. And John Rawls thought that uh, Ray ought to do something serious with his life. But when it became clear that he was not going to, he said that he should go to NYU at, at any rate and study with Ronald Dworkin, so, <laughs> which Ray did. And then he went on to you know, what can only be described as a glittering career in the, in the US Attorney's Office for uh, the Southern District. If you've watched the show Billions, you, you pretty much know it all, but Ray, uh, Ray was, Ray was in charge of the Madoff investigation and, you know, really, really, really big cases, and he was just a marvelous leader in that office. He also 
uh, worked at Cleary Got Gottlieb, which was Judge Friendly's old firm, so that's um, appropriate. And most important, he is chair of our awards committee here at the uh, ALI. Uh, I should also have said that President Obama nominated him to the Second Circuit when Justice Sotomayor became justice, and um, no offense, Katanji, but Ray was unanimously confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> by the United States Senate. So uh, it is my privilege to ask Ray to come forward and to make the award of the friendly battle. I should have bought my wife here <laughs> to listen to David because when I told her that I was presenting this award, her reaction was, why you? <laughs> Thank you very much, David, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I must tell you it's a very great honor to be able to present this extremely prestigious medal. Let me start by talking a bit about Judge Henry Friendly. 36 years after he died, Judge Henry Friendly is revered not only by his former law clerks, but also by knowledgeable jurists, lawyers, and academics literally everywhere. He was widely regarded as the greatest judge of his time and one of the greatest federal judges of all time. Chief Justice Roberts, who clerked for Just, uh, Judge Friendly, once said, no one today is remotely like him. My colleague, Pierre Laval, also a friendly clerk, this will be a theme, <laughs> put it this way, he was a genius. He carried virtually all of law in his head. I myself never had the good fortune of meeting Judge Friendly, whose former chambers actually are just below mine in the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse in New York. I first really focused on him when I was a young associate at Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton, formerly Cleary Gottlieb Friendly and Cox, uh, as David mentioned. And one of my mentors there, a senior partner named Ed Kerr, had worked very closely with Judge Friendly when he ran the firm's litigation department. And one night, for his own reasons, I think, Ed showed me a memo he'd once written for Friendly that he'd kept and I immediately understood why he'd kept it. Because in the margins of the memo, written by Ed Kerr, Friendly had scribbled, as I remember it, Kerr, there is much in this memorandum that is intelligent and novel. Unfortunately, what is intelligent is not novel, and what is novel is not intelligent. <laughs> How's that for feedback, my friends? The, the ALI was near and dear to Judge Friendly's heart. In their written response, or proposal rather, to the ALI to establish the Friendly Medal, a subcommittee of his clerks recommended that it be awarded periodically to a distinguished judge, academic, government official, or practicing lawyer for truly distinguished contributions in the law, in the tradition of Judge Friendly, and the American Law Institute. Merrick Garland, who clerked for Judge Friendly, is as worthy as anyone we know to be added to the dazzling and very, very, very short list of past recipients who met these criteria in the last 36 years, including, as many of us will recall just before the pandemic, Justices Kennedy and Ginsburg. Now, in preparing for this introduction, I asked to see the recommendation letters that were submitted on Merrick's behalf for election to the ALI in 1998, the year after Merrick became a judge. These things we can access, it turns out. So beware. I will tell you that Merrick had some extremely heavy hitters pulling for him. Michael Boudin of the First Circuit, Patricia Wald of the DC Circuit, and the great Bill Coleman, all of whom themselves would eventually 
become recipients of the friendly medal. And they each noted what can only be described as Merrick's exceptional background and credentials. Here are just a few highlights. After serving as a clerk for Judge Friendly, Merrick was hired by Justice Brennan, apparently sight unseen and without an interview. Is that, is that right? <laughs> he then served for a number of years as a superb practitioner and partner at Arnold and Porter, taught as a lecturer at Harvard, and at the same time as he was doing all that, wrote serious lead articles for both the Harvard Law Review and the Yale Law Journal. Before his judicial appointment, he also held top government posts within the Department of Justice, where, as I think we all know, he famously oversaw the investigations into both the Oklahoma City bombings and the Unabomber. In his recommendation, to the, uh, recommendation letter to the ALI on Merrick's behalf, Michael Boudin, of course also a friendly clerk, predicted that, I'm gonna quote this here, quote, Merrick stands a chance of being one of the outstanding judges of his generation. There is no doubt that he will do first class work and lots of it, but I firmly believe that his is going to go beyond that. We have the opportunity to add to the Institute's membership a truly remarkable figure. Close quote, 1998. As a federal judge, Merrick more than fulfilled that prediction. But let me just add a touch of color. What also comes through in these and other letters that I've read and what I know from personal experience is that Merrick is humble, unassuming, kind, and extremely generous with his time. He is foremost, as one of his ALI recommenders called, uh, called him, a first-rate human being. And it's almost certainly for that reason that the fervor of Judge Friendly's law clerks for Judge Friendly is matched step for step by the fervor of Judge Garland's law clerks for Judge Garland. Now, ever the overachiever, since his appointment to the bench, Merrick managed to pad his resume a bit. <laughs> as chief judge of the DC circuit, he was and still is deeply admired by his colleagues as brilliant, collegial, a consensus uh, builder, a true leader, and what one of his colleagues described as a straight shooter. While serving as chief judge, he also served as chair of the executive committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, which, my friends, is no small feat. Let me just describe the position this way. If the chief justice of the United States is basically the chairman of the board, Merrick was for a, a long time its supremely able but extremely busy CEO. And for that, I personally thank him. Lastly, when I think of uh, Merrick and his current position as Attorney General of the United States, I think two things. First, the friendly clerks have finally realized their long-held dream of cornering the market on the American justice system. <laughs> Second, I can't help but to draw a parallel between Merrick and David Levy's father, Edward Levy, who served as Attorney General during the Ford administration and who was often described as the model of a modern Attorney General who brought two qualities to the job, a rare intellectuality and a level of integrity such as there could never be any doubt about his honesty, forthrightness, or truthfulness. Now, before I hand you this uh, very heavy medal, uh, Merrick, I have to read you an email and then a letter from some people you know, and uh, I think that these might be of interest to you. The first is an email message I got from Sri Srinivasan, uh, your very worthy successor as chief judge, who's here tonight at your table, and it reads, on behalf of all of your former colleagues on our court, Merrick, heartiest congratulations to you on receiving the friendly medal. We know how much it must mean to you as a former clerk to Judge Friendly to be honored with an award bearing his name. And as we on the court know firsthand from working alongside you for many years, the award's recognition of brilliance, judiciousness, careful analysis, reasoned application, tireless energy, and keen wit 
so well captures your time with us as a colleague and as our chief judge. Please know that we join in celebrating this evening with you a most fitting and worthy recipient of this special medal. The second letter is dated today, uh, and it reads as follows. Dear Merrick, congratulations on your receipt of the American Law Institute's prestigious Henry J. Medal, uh, Friendly Medal. You once described Judge Friendly as an intellectual giant so energetic his pen never left paper. Those same qualities have characterized your public service. In every endeavor, as advocate, jurist, and executive, you have demonstrated discerning judgment and tireless commitment to the law. You also have modeled decency and generosity that magnify the admiration you have earned as a colleague and a mentor to so many in the profession. The judiciary is deeply grateful for your service to the branch and your continuing commitment to the cause of justice. Judge Friendly would surely be proud of your many accomplishments since you left his chambers. Sincerely, John G. Roberts, Jr. It's now my honor and privilege to present the Henry J. Friendly Medal to the Honorable Merrick B. Garland. Thank you, Ray. My wife is here. <laughs> she also said, why you? <laughs> However, she has an open mind. And having heard your uh, introduction, I'm hoping she will now be understanding as to why. <laughs> this is an enormous honor for me. The ALI was uh, Judge Friendly's number one extracurricular activity in the year in which I clerked. Uh, the only other activity was uh, going to uh, Britain with Michael Boudin and uh, his beloved Sophie. So this means an enormous amount. It also means an more enormous amount that the HJF clerks are here. Uh, and I'm gonna try and um, not repeat too many stories that you already know. And uh, it also means a lot that the MBG clerks are here. Uh, for which I am honored and very grateful. I will say that uh, receiving an award in the name of Judge Friendly was the furthest thing from my mind uh, during my clerkship year. The closest thing in my mind was surviving the clerkship. <laughs> And a lot of this was true because we entered this clerkship, as all the HJF clerks know, uh, with a series of legends having been given to us, rumors about how tough and demanding the judge was uh, and how a set in his ways uh, he was uh, and how unreasonable he was. <laughs> now, it turned out he was demanding and tough, but the other two were really not true. So just two examples. Uh, the first, uh, we were told, that uh, we had to get citation form exactly right. And the rumor was that one of the judge's clerks who did not get citation form exactly right was fired. So one day I'm sitting, uh, I, I'm, the judge of course did almost every single one of his uh, drafts, uh, opinions, first draft himself. He gave us uh, um, the, the drafts and uh, if we were lucky we would fix citations. Uh, but mostly it was uh, completely done. Um, I s took the draft, I saw a number of citation mistakes, I corrected them, gave them back to him. And I'm sitting at my chair and in those days the way in which the judge would summon you, he had his doors closed for the chambers, was to buzz you, which would cause you to jump about five inches off the chair because you had no idea it was coming. Uh, so I walk into uh, his room, into the chambers, and he goes like this. 
and I have no idea what he is. So I come around his desk. He opens the center drawer, and he brings out a little pamphlet, maybe 12, 13 pages long. And it says right on the front, a uniform system of citation. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to get a prop from my um, ass assistant here. It's what we do with chiefs of staff in the Justice Department. <laughs> so, it did not say, as this one, which is the second to last one, a uniform system of citation, 20th edition, and it was not 5,000 pages long. <laughs> Just, as I said, just a few pages long, it said a uniform system of citation. Not first edition, not second edition. And I'm looking at it and it says, a uniform system of citation, Henry J. Friendly, President, Harvard Law Review. <laughs> this is the original blue book in my hands. And he says to me, or in the way he growled, I think I'm entitled to decide how to do citations myself. <laughs> I said, fine, and I never fixed another citation. <laughs> Second example, he had a revolving bookcase in his chambers with uh, shelves uh, apart just enough to fit in uh, those old cardboard containers that magazines used to be put in in the library. They could fit an eight and a half by 11 brief, but they could not fit a number of the additional motions papers, which back in the day we had, which were in legal. So every single one of, uh, of these boxes had everything squished into the box. And I said to the secretary, couldn't we get you know, bigger boxes? Couldn't we put it in the regular um, uh, bookcase? Do we have to stick it in this little bookcase? She said, the judge likes things the way they are. Five days later, he's just been visiting Judge Barry Waterman in the chambers across the way. He comes stomping into the office, boiling mad, and he says, Judge Waterman has these big plastic boxes. Why do I have this little tiny thing crammed with paper? We stopped using the rotating bookcase. We got plas big plastic boxes. So those legends about him were just not true. What was true? was he was enormously devoted to his craft, that he was enormously focused on the task in front of him, and that his work ethic could not be matched. Ray mentions the um, uh, quotation, um, I think must be from the chief, about uh, his pen never leaving uh, his hand. That is uh, actually literally true. On another occasion, uh, the buzzer goes off, I jump, I go into his uh, chambers, and there he is. He has in one hand uh, the pen he's writing with. He's writing the first draft. He, we just had, had a, uh, the oral argument, and he's writing the first draft. And in his other hand, there's another pen. And he's writing like this. And he's not saying anything to me. He's not, he's not even looking at me. I back out, and I say to the secretary who's in the outside, and say to the secretary who's in the outside office, what does he want me to do? And she said, you know, it's like the surgeon in the operating room and the nurse, and he needs another scalpel. He's run out of ink in the pen that's in his hand. <laughs> Slap another new pen into his hand. So I do. He drops the pen he's working in, switches hands, <laughs> continues writing. And this explains how he was able to write over 1,000 opinions. Ah, uh, okay, so that's true. Uh, the other thing uh, that was true is that he was remote, he was austere, he was uh, an intellectual giant, he was never unkind, uh, but what he really loved was jousting intellectually with his clerks. I think the best thing uh, you could do as a clerk is uh, tell him and then back up uh, that uh, something he had said uh, or written was wrong. So, um, you know, we, uh, we never wrote bench memos. Uh, he would read the briefs, we would read the briefs. We would, when we're all done, we would come into his office and uh, we would orally discuss the case, go back and forth, but it would begin with, what do you think? So I was, as you can imagine, really tempted to say, what do you think? <laughs> but that was clearly not uh, approved. So 
you get sort of brave and you learn a lot about how to argue with the greatest judge of his era. I had um, every year, uh, by, by, by the time I became a clerk, he had sort of, I don't know, gotten a little liberal in the sense that instead of writing every single first draft, he would let the clerks write one first draft. So I drew the short straw and I got a scintillating ERISA case. <laughs> I'm not gonna bother to explain ERISA to those of you who are not laughing. <laughs> so it was a very hard question about how ERISA applied uh, to the issue. Um, the judges heard the case, the panel decided the way Judge Friendly thought it should decide, which is how the panels always decided in my day. <laughs> and he assigned the case uh, to me to do my first draft. I uh, opened the briefs again and looked at the ERISA statute, was, which those of you who know, not exactly the model of clarity, but in the beginning, there are a series of transition rules, which I had not noticed before. And neither had Judge Friendly, neither had any judge on the panel, neither had any of the lawyers, neither had the district judge. It turns out ERISA at the time was a pretty new uh, uh, law, and it had transition rules. It would not apply, certain provisions would not apply for a certain number of years to get people ready. Uh, ERISA did not apply at all to the transactions <laughs> involved in this case. Uh, but I, you know, I had to be absolutely sure. And uh, the only ERISA reporter available in the New York metropolitan uh, area um, uh, uh, was in Brooklyn Law School, so I had to go there on the subway and um, find the reporter. So this is taking me a while, you know. Judge Friendly always finished a draft opinion within a day, day and a half, two days, constant writing, pen never leaving paper of the oral argument. And he, you know, he gave me a break. Three days in, he says, where's that ERISA opinion? <laughs> so I was quaking, I said, Judge, it will be on your desk tomorrow morning. This is a sort of not a safe thing to be saying at this point. <laughs> That night, instead of an opinion, I wrote him a memo explaining, look, I understand that no one has raised this issue, it's not jurisdictional, but the question here is a difficult one, and it has no application to this case at all. And I put it on his desk, we got in early, he came in at 10 o'clock in those days, and uh, he, he goes in, he doesn't stop and look at me, he just, of course, assumed that the opinion would be on his desk, he goes into his chambers, slams the door, I am waiting for the buzzer, and the detonation, <laughs> he comes out, he's never done this before, he comes out of the door of his chambers and he says, oh, now I understand what took so long, this is so interesting, let's figure out what to do. <laughs> so my great opinion turns out to be one memo saying there won't be an opinion and one, one order to show cause to the parties as to why the appeal should not be dismissed. They had no cause, the appeal was dismissed. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so another thing that was true is that the judge decided every case on the merits, every case by an application of law and the facts. Never his personal preference and often contrary to his personal preference, this is what he taught his law clerks. And this is what his friend, Attorney General Ed Levy, John and David's father, taught the prosecutors at the Justice Department when he became the Attorney General right after Watergate. If I am successful at even one thing in my tenure as Attorney General, I hope it should be that I can bring back the friendly Levy norms about the way in which principal decision making is made, that like cases are decided alike. There is no preference for Democrats over Republicans, friends over foes, the rich over the poor, powerful over the powerless, or that the decisions make any difference based on ethnicity. These are what they taught. These are what they taught, and this is what I am trying to teach and model uh, to the next generation of Justice Department prosecutors. Now, before I sit down, I, I can't go, let the time go by without uh, mentioning the 
horrific attack uh, in Buffalo uh, last weekend. Um, I'm gonna repeat what I said uh, on that day, which is the Justice Department is going to be relentlessly and is relentlessly inve investigating this as a hate crime as, and as a matter of racially motivated violent extremism. You know, the Justice Department was founded in 1870 in the aftermath of the Civil War during Reconstruction with the first principal purpose to protect black Americans from white supremacists and particularly the Ku Klux Klan who were trying to take away their civil liberties. The Justice Department regards this as its legal obligation still and approaches this with the same degree of urgency as we approached it in 1870. But there is more here. <laughs> Confronting hate and preventing hate crimes is a moral obligation of every American if we expect to be able to continue to live in a democracy. And that is what we intend to do. Thank you.